I, I do have a little bit of a cold, so I hope my voice will carry. Well, my name is Jalmar Fos, and uh, I'm from Uppsala University and also the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. And uh, I will do this all by myself. My associate means Otto Arnfeldt. I left on a beach in Rio. <laughs> uh, and uh, um, so. Uh, but I should say something about him, that he is a research pharmacist and we are working together on this project and uh, uh, I will, I'm responsible for the historical parts and he is responsible for the laboratory parts. So this is an effort to both map and make Teriak. And to give you a very short background to what the stuff that we are doing, we are interested in the European tradition of pharmacy before the industrialization, before the arrival of big business, before uh, European pharmacy became chemicized in a, a part of chemistry in, in the modern sense, in the 19th century. So we are interested in reconstructing exactly the same, a similar tradition to that found in, in China, for example, where taste and smell and texture carries medical meaning in a way that it doesn't do any more in, in Western pharmacy. We're also interested in the art of the apothecary, how you buy, assess quality, how you prepare, store and handle drugs in the early modern European pharmacy, and also recipes and the meaning of ex exotic ingredients and so on. So this is a, a part of a much larger project. So, Teliak then, just to give you a short introduction on what this means. Teliak is a classical medicine. It existed already in Greek antiquity, composed of uh, about 70 ingredients, uh, opium, honey, valerian root, viper meat, and so on. And there's a quite good recipe, uh, which is found in, uh, <coughs> it's actually written by Galen himself. So this testifies also for the huge importance uh, and fame of this specific early uh, composition. So Galen wrote about this in a letter to, to a guy called Piso. Uh, if we move forward a little bit, Teriac was composed throughout the Middle Ages, and the most famous Teriac that existed in the Middle Ages was the Montpellier Teriac. And this, of course, was not exactly the same as the one in uh, as the Galenic original recipe, because the recipe has morphed a little bit, changed here and there, to, to, uh, and of course there's not a perfect continuity in medical traditions, but still, uh, it's a, still recognized them as teriac. Then following the Montpellier teriac came the fame of the Venice teriac, and uh, the Venetian teriac, I think, was also a reconstructed teriac in the sense that it draw back on the uh, classical antique sources. Uh, and uh, uh, so these were the very famous teriacs con constructed and made in specific places that also were central nodes in the trade networks uh, of early medicine. So the Montpellier School of Medicine was extremely famous. They had lots of apothecaries doing the teriacs in Montpellier. Hence, they, had, they were at the center of trade networks, so they could go, do a really good teriac. And of course, Venice later on was also the center of trade in medicinal spices and drugs, which meant that the Venetian teriac was held in especially high regard. But there were many, many cities and apothecaries and others who produced their own teriac, often following different varieties, different types of recipes. Um, and if we then move on to the 16th and 17th century, uh, experimentation in Europe, as you know, exploded. Everybody was interested in creating new things, doing things that were unknown before, and there was also an increasing trade contact, of course, due to the discovery of the New World, as well as deepened and increased contacts with uh, East Asia. So you would have lots of different teriaks produced in the early modern period. Some of them had several hundreds of ingredients. Some were deliberately classicist, returning as well as they could to Galen's original recipe. And here we have some from our, one of our Swedish actors. And you see that it's rather fun that he has these kind of secret medicines. Each of, each, each of the secret medicine is associated with a specific way of governing the state. <laughs> Uh, 
And the work that we do, we are reconstructing the Galenic, the original Galenic Teriak uh, in the laboratory. But we are doing this not trying to return to the original classical sources, but we are returning to the recipe in the Pharmacopeia Augustana, which was the most famous uh, Pharmacopeia used in the European, uh, basically in, in the German-speaking parts of Europe and also in the European North and extending also into France and the Netherlands. They were very much interested in the Pharmacopeia Augustana. And the Pharmacopeia Augustana is special insofar that <coughs> it was first constructed by a group of very well-schooled uh, medical doctors and apothecaries who were deep into the study of classical sources. So they were a, a kind of Renaissance humanists and they returned to the original classical recipe of, uh, of the teriyak in their effort to make a new teriyak uh, which would be suitable for, for the early modern taste. And in order to do so, they of course needed to make substitutions so, for example, balsam of Judea, which was an important part of the original teriyak, uh, the plant, the tree, was extinguished during this period. It didn't exist anymore. It had, they had just uh, wiped out everything uh, in order to get hold of this balsam of Judea. So instead, they substituted balsam of Peru uh, as another way of, of, of doing the teriyak. And they did many things like this. So it was not exactly the same but still they considered it equal or even better than Gala's Teriyak. And uh, so we have here uh, clearly differences, but also a very, very hard work in finding the drugs, finding the original plants, finding in the correlates between plant name and plant substance and so on, that we have also seen in the Mexican example. To, in, order to, in order to find, and also of course in the Chinese, in order to find specific substances and, and go back and, and find a recipe that would be interesting to, to use. So then, what's uh, pharmacopoeia? Well, we tend to regard these as uh, more or less collections of recipes, but they are actually not collections of recipes. The first and most important function of the pharmacopoeia is to act as a legal document that formalizes the relationship between a physician and an apothecary. So if the physician wrote down his prescription for the patient, then it was legally required of the apothecary that he should compose the medicine in the pharmacopoeia. So it's only in its secondary function that it actually is a collection of recipes intended to be used on a daily basis in a laboratory setting. And you can see here, I think this is really important, you see the format of this book. This is, a, uh, this is uh, the same book as, as here, uh, Augustana. And you see that the format is actually made to be used in the pharmaceutical laboratory. So for each each drug has its own line to make it easy to follow with the eye and, and also go through line, line after line in order to, to compose. So you can see clearly that it's, it's uh, designed to, to be practically used. And in these early, these early books were of course very expensive, but in later books you can also see how in, in the 17th and 18th and also 19th century, when they had these pharmacopoeias bound, they bound them with perhaps one, two, or even three pages between each page of text in order to add their own different compositions and varieties and so on. So you see that they are clearly, they are clearly designed to be used uh, as tools rather than <coughs> books to read. Uh, so teriyak is a heavily controlled substance. Uh, so, and this is a very good reason to try to, to work with teriyak you know, if you are interested in actually composing a medicine uh, according to early modern style, because it's one of the few recipes that probably would have been followed to the letter by apothecaries, uh, because there were often medical doctors present in the room when you composed your teriyak, so you actually had to do it precisely according to the letter of the book, and you could never substitute anything, because if you substituted, you were a fraud. Uh, with other, uh, the other recipes, it was often necessary to substitute. 
uh, because I mean, imagine not having access to what, what, for example, cinnamon. Uh, if you would do recipes with cinnamon uh, all uh, during the autumn, come and spring, you would have no cinnamon left, so you would have to use cassia or something different. So. Uh, especially in, in the northern parts of Europe, where you were far away from the trade networks, this was absolutely necessary. But in the case of Teriak, it was forbidden, so, so we know that there is a correspondence. Uh, I'll skip that on the Kolmiensis. But uh, the, problem, the thing here with using uh, the Teriak, which was uh, in the Agustana, is that the Teriak of the Agustana continued into the recipe of the Kolmiensis. And uh, uh, the Pharmacopoeia Hormiensis of 1686 uh, was in use uh, until 1771 in the Swedish realm. And this means that we have a stable recipe going on for 200 years, and which is connected to the precise group around Linnaeus himself. So this makes it really easy for us when we, when we are dealing with this recipe to actually trace name straight into the Linnean system and the Linnean nomenclature. So we have quite good ideas about what substances are actually included in the recipe. And as you can see, teriyak has been sold in pharmacies well into the 20th century and it still exists, but these recipes are, are, are very much simplified recipes. It's not the uh, complex 100 ingredient teriyaks that, that uh, were used in the early modern period. So, uh, about the problems that we have in a project like this. One of the first problems I have mentioned already, and that's about correlating substances and names. How do we know when we have a name and a description, like camphor here, for example? How do we know that this actually corresponds to a modern substance that we hold in our hand? Uh, and of course, Linnaeus is a good answer to this, but actually, this was really easy because the group behind the Augustana and the original recipe were excellent philologists. So they went around uh, and had connections to networks that collected information about all of these plants. So this is a reason why it's easy for us to actually reconstruct this recipe uh, because there's a living tradition going back all the way to the 16th century uh, from our present day knowledge of pharmacy, where we can access the healthy early modern discussion on medical substances found in lexica, herbals, pharmaceutical handbooks, journals, and so on. So this was not such a big problem as we actually had thought. Because early modern authors were really, really good at this, actually. Uh, There's another thing about correlating texts and objects in a project like this. And this is that we know quite a lot that they had no idea about. We know things like action in the body on molecular level for many of these substances. We know how to grow this plant almost anywhere. And if you go for, for example here, uh, in the case of Chinese medical rhubarb root, Here's a contemporary sample, and you can go into to PubMed or any database, and you and you see there are claims about the which chemicals in this substance have specific effects. This is a very powerful laxative, so you, you can see which chemicals have specific effects. But simultaneously, this does not tell all of the story. We can also grow this plant in Uppsala. It was completely unknown in Europe, uh, well into the 19th century. Uh, to actually have living specimens of this plant. Uh, but it, uh, it was imported only in a dried form. But simultaneously, there are so many things that we don't know. And one of these things is how to recognize quality or adulterations by means of the senses. So how does it feel to handle? How does it feel to ingest? what meanings are invested in a substance like this. I mean, we can take a sample of, of Chinese rhubarb and eat it, but this doesn't give us any sense of the magic and wonder and fantastic experience for an early modern period to know that I'm handling something which has come all the way from China. And this, of course, has, would have had an enormously powerful placebo effect. <laughs> 
Um, and we, we have no idea of reconstructing or understanding anything about this, this, these kind of mental concepts, mental formations surrounding these substances. So we have to reconstruct these as best as we can. And this from Michael Boy, Flora Sinensis, this is the first European depiction of the plants for a European audience. Uh, and uh, here we got access to samples from traditional Chinese medicine. Uh, so these are sourced in, in uh, Sichuan province. And what's interesting is that when you compare these samples from you, you, which, were, which are intended as the best quality available if you want to use this plant in traditional Chinese medicine. And when we opened this sample, it smelled wonderful, fragrant, pungent, strong, and it was this clear sense that here I have something which is a medicine. It really smelled like a medicine. Uh, I don't know what it's good for, but I'll eat it because it will make me feel better. That was the kind of general sense. But when handling these Western sam samples, it was clearly the same substance. You had kind of an indication of the smell, but these, these, these qualities of smell are not actually valued in Western medicine. I mean, it's not important that a substance smells. But in traditional, in, in, other, in other medical tradition, a thing like smell can be a deep carrier of meaning and also adding dimensions to, to, to the medical value and the healing process. And this is exactly the reason why we are interested in handling the substances in order to learn more about the early modern period. Because if we can access things like smell, taste, texture, we can also understand more about how the early modern apothecary pharmacies worked with these substances in a traditional way, more which kind of reminds you of the traditional healers working in, in other places, uh, in non-Western traditions, um, before the 20th century. Um, so that's Chinese rhubarb. Uh, to move on to this, from all, from, from all realms of nature we have things uh, in this. I mean, it's over a hundred components, so I cannot go into all the specificities of these things, but terra sigillata, it's medical clay. Uh, hundreds of varieties were available to early modern. Here's just a sample of the collection from Uppsala universities. So what qualities and bodily effects were they after in a good terra sigillata? And this is where we, took, we have gone to modern chemical analysis in order to actually analyze the samples and we have found that exactly what some of these samples of terra sigillata contains, and we decided that, okay, we can use actually Uppsala earth <laughs> in order to do our terra sigillata. The terra sigillata Uppsaliensis is the type of thing that we have decided to go for. And also because we, of course, don't want to use these beautiful early modern samples um, and destroy them. That would be rather <coughs> silly of us. And then we have other decisions, like for example the viper pills. And uh, this is uh, the common viper. It's easy to find. We could go out in the countryside outside of Uppsala and source our common vipers. But it's protected under the Berne Convention because it's not so common anymore in Europe. So we decided that we would not use viper in our viper pills. But I have this quotation here which kind of shows how precise the knowledge about medical substances was in the early modern period. So this is from Christopher Meyer, who, who in a kind of commercial brochure about his own teriyak, and he said that you should use trochis impressed to the image of a viper on the one side, on the other face, side the face of a beautiful virgin. These have been made from selected vipers, which are called marassi in Italian, and collected from the, collected from the Giugian Hills near Bologna in the month of April, as testified for by the physicians Andrea Furno, Angelio Montagmana, and Andrea Sacco. So you see here how precise instructions were how to find the vipers. And, what, and exactly which vipers you should use. But we decided not to use this, so we have instead just substituted frog legs uh, to have something which is uh, organic and, uh, and uh, meat, basically. We could have used meat, but uh, we decided frog legs, why not? Um, <coughs> so, 
So here's a little bit about the reproduction. And uh, one of the things to know about doing this is that it took us two days of hard physical labor to compose Teriyak when we did it correctly the first time. And this also is important information about early modern pharmacy, that in order to make a composite medicine like this, you actually had to work hard physical with your body, with a mortar, and alternating between mortar and scales, mortar scales, mortar scales, for two days in order to compose this medicine. And another interesting thing is also that uh, it should, after that, it should age for at least uh, five years and preferably seven years or more. So there's also interesting chemical interactions going on in the composition, making the, the whole much more than the sum of the parts, eventually. And here's a little bit about measuring and the making of trochist. We have this trochist press, which is rather fun. These are marzipan, actually, but it says opium. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we are kind of trying out the equipment to see how does the equipment work and so on. And this is also important from, for, from a museum science perspective because I mean ma many of these tools, the no it was known to apothecaries and no, sorry, pharmacists how to use these tools uh, up until about 30, 40 years ago. But now knowledge is fading. Nobody is actually remembering anymore what these tools were good for and how to use them in the proper way. Uh, so this is also kind of relearning the skills of the pharmacy. And here we have another powder. Uh, and here's, here's the finished product. And as you can see, it specifies that we should use a copper bowl in doing the final mixing. And this means, again, on a, on a chemical level, this could mean that a small amount of uh, tin goes into the final composition. Uh, and uh, maybe this has some meaning, maybe it doesn't have any meaning. It's extremely difficult to say when you work with 100 plant substances, you would have at least 100, sometimes a couple of hundred active ingredients, uh, molecules, molecular compounds in each substance. So it kind of adds up into an enormous complexity. And then it should age for seven years. So this complexity immediately turns into another huge complexity. And that's where I need my pharmaceutical chemist. <laughs> because there's absolutely no way for me to, to kind of figure out the complexities here. But Nils Otto, he can do analysis and has also the networks and friends to borrow the latest chemical equipment uh, used by pharmacologists in Uppsala and in Stockholm. So he, he can actually do quite a lot of really complex analysis on these drugs and see how it would correspond to modern medicines and if there are compounds there that would actually be interesting also from a modern medical uh, point of view. So, so this, is, uh, this is the kind of work that we are doing. And um, yeah, so thanks for listening. I hope I have some time.